Welcome, we'll be starting in a few minutes once more people have arrived. Welcome to tonight's event. We'll be starting in just a minute.
Welcome. I'm Daniel Jacobson, director of the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization. And um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our talk. Down at the bottom of your screen, if you scroll down, there's a Q&A button. At any time during the talk or after during the Q&A session, you can write a question um, there. If you are a student, please indicate that and we'll give your question priority. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce John Parrish Peaty, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, who's awarded more than $500 million in federal grants to cultural organizations and universities since 2017. His previous positions include publisher of the Virginia Quarterly Review at the University of Virginia, literature grants director at the National Endowment for the Arts, director of the NEA Operation Homecoming, writing the wartime experience program, director of the NEA Big Read program and editor at Mercer University Press. He's written speeches for US president and the librarian of Congress. Mr. Peaty holds degrees from Vanderbilt University and the University of Mississippi. He's the co-editor of Inside the Church of Flannery O'Connor, Sacrament, Sacramental and the Sacred in Her Fiction, and editor of a bilingual anthology of contemporary American fiction. Tonight, Mr. Petey will speak to us on the liberal arts in an illiberal, illiberal age. Over to you, John. Thank you, Dan. It's my pleasure to join you. And it's my pleasure to speak again at the University of Colorado at Boulder. I'm delighted to address the Benson Center for many reasons, including the fact that former CU President Bruce Benson once served on the National Council on the Humanities, my agency's advisory board. Since 1965, the National Endowment for the Humanities has awarded $70 million to the state of Colorado, including more than $7 million to the university. Now in this address, I'm gonna wear two hats. It's a literary critic, and as NEH chairman. I was educated in the Western literary tradition and remain a steadfast advocate. My federal grant making, of course, incorporates additional fields and aesthetics. I believe passionately in the enduring value of the liberal arts to university life and to American society. My thesis today is straightforward. The ever-expanding Western literary canon is central to the liberal arts and illiberal ideologies are weakening not only the canon, but the free exchange of ideas and other essential elements of a truly inclusive educational community. By the term illiberalism, I mean discouraging and suppressing unpopular viewpoints through undemocratic actions rooted ultimately in intolerance. Now, many of my concerns about the decline of collegiality and how we advance arguments in the academy are well stated by English professor Kathleen Fitzpatrick in her recent book, Generous Thinking, A Radical Approach to Saving the University. And she asserts, and I'll read this at a little length, quote, the critical thinking that forms the center of higher education today has come to be seen as privileging negation rather than creation of ideas and institutions. The problem with this critical mode is not that its insights aren't correct, nor that the structures of contemporary culture don't require critique, but rather first, the critique has become less a means of paving the way toward a better alternative than an end in itself. And two, that this mode of critique of rejection a refusal has metastasized, becoming the dominant mode of political reaction in recent years, unquote. Fitzpatrick's analysis of higher education summarizes the state of affairs for the Western literary tradition too. It's being negated on many campuses. To defend the Western canon is not to seal it off from adjustment, Indeed, across the humanities, we must embrace greater knowledge of global culture and world heritage, even as we strengthen efforts to preserve and promote those unique cultural assets that distinguish our nation, including the customs and traditions 
of indigenous people. Nor do I believe that book knowledge can only be conveyed in the form of a book. We must support the advancement of technology, even as we hold fast to the absolute requirement that humanistic fields of ethics and bioethics be at the decision-making center, especially in light of the growth of artificial intelligence and the pervasive negative influence of social media on societal norms. Deciding how and what to teach is a policy matter. And one must establish the values from which policy decisions emanate. When I began at NEH, I stated that our agency is steadfastly committed to unfettered access to knowledge, the promise of critical reasoning, apolitical research and scholarship, mutual respect in our interactions, and robust dialogues where we do not set up straw men as substitutes for those of goodwill who see the world in different terms than we do. These criteria would serve departments well too. I would like to add kindness. The world could always use a bit more kindness and decency and goodwill. These are the traits of a community of trust and the modern university should be nothing less. I applaud the University of Colorado for having centers of excellence on the American West, the First Amendment, Western civilization and other topics each committed to bringing people together across ideological lines. There is nothing more clearly in the wheelhouse of the humanities than uniting people through the development of their minds. The humanities unveil lives, reveal cultures, explain nations to themselves and to the world. Those of us who love the arts and humanities can prevail in the long run only if we make clear, cogent cases for our public value, our economic value, our irrefutable societal value. To the extent that I am capable of making such arguments myself, I must credit the extraordinary liberal arts faculty who educated me in and out of the classroom. My fondness for tradition may be tied to my undergraduate mentors, for they gave me a way of seeing the world that has had such lasting value that I would not wish it to perish without some attempt to illuminate it, to affirm it, to claim it, even as I am engaged daily in funding the very scholars and humanistic projects that are expanding and occasionally displacing their life's work. A century ago, in the aftermath of the Great War, the concept of tradition as a societal positive was understandably out of fashion and maligned on the continent. T.S. Eliot wrote of tradition, quote, seldom perhaps does the word appear except in a phrase of censure. If otherwise, it is vaguely appropriate in the implication as to the work approved of some pleasing archeological reconstruction." Quote. He was right then and even more so today. I think we should reclaim tradition or the best of it rather and should do so properly. Tradition refined, not destroyed but we cannot reclaim it without first acknowledging who was left out and left out by whom and why. We must claim the tradition of the Harlem Renaissance, not only the Italian Renaissance. We must claim the tradition of Mozart, but also Motown, of Shakespeare, but also the suffragettes, not just Keats truth and beauty, but Sojourner truths too. This is my personal philosophy, but also my professional one as a grant maker to truly create a vibrant and healthy and sustainable culture. The answer is almost always both and rather than either or. One of the central habits of mind in the humanities is that we must bring discernment 
the works of art, literature, and music in order to separate the creator from the creation. We should always direct a critical eye toward what we hazard to admire. The creator often lets us down. I worry about a time when a writer as gifted as Shakespeare is no longer taught because of the limits of his understanding of humanity. I worry about what is happening on campuses where we do not have spaces such as the Benson Center where scholarly disagreements can be addressed in a constructive manner. I worry that is about the direction of the modern university when it is no longer rooted in the humanities. I mean rooted. I mean anchored down to the bedrock of the foundational tradition of the free exchange of ideas. I worry that we are losing this essential tradition. We are increasingly living in an age where the quick knee-jerk reaction on Twitter stands in as a substitute for actual dialogue. Before the pandemic, on one representative campus, students piled child, uh, chairs around a stage and beat drums to prevent and invite a guest from speaking. I do not understand the impulse to build barricades to block ideas that appall us. Our brains are not such fragile things. We must not normalize this behavior. We must not infantilize our students. At age 18, they can be sent against their will into mortal combat in a foreign land for an undeclared war. Yet supposedly they lack the psychological strength to read Toni Morrison's Beloved without a trigger warning. This position is neither sustainable nor logical and it sells the youth of America short. It ignores their emotional intelligence and it encourages other generations, including potential employers, to look down upon them as less capable of functioning in a pluralistic society. If an undergraduate never hears an intelligently stated position that she disagrees with, then her tuition payments have been squandered. A university cannot simultaneously lack viewpoint diversity and call itself diverse. So I am on the side of free speech in every context that does not physically endanger other people. I agree with the University of Chicago position on the freedom of expression. We need more ideological diversity on our campuses, but I have no interest as a taxpayer, an educator, or a parent in bringing a white supremacist to campus, for example, to shout provocative ignorant statements. There is no intellectual grounding in that odious position. I don't want my time, my tax dollars, or my tuition to be spent on that. As a grant maker, my job is literally to make value judgments. So yes, some speech is worthier of federal investment than others. Tocqueville over trolls. Regarding my academic field of literature, I am reminded of something that happened at the Fellowship of Southern Writers gathering years ago. Panelists were discussing how the region's literature was profoundly shaped by the South's defeat in the Civil War. That's when Natasha Trethway spoke up and declared, my South didn't lose that war. Do you see the essentialness of that? We must always ask, who is the we? Whose South? Must the white male Southerner with Confederates in the attic always be the official voice? Or can, for example, Trethway, born in Mississippi to African an African-American mother and a white Canadian father, can she be the voice? Can this former U.S. Poet Laureate and winner of the Pulitzer Prize be the voice? The answer, of course, is yes. And who does she hold up as a literary model? Robert Penn Warren, among others. And she is the casual reader of his work. She knows it inside and out. And she holds him accountable. And in doing so, holds us as readers and citizens accountable. In her final Poet Laureate lecture, Trethway wrote, quote, what I want to point out 
is that we miss something of the transformative power of language across time and space when we consider only certain works in isolation and not a writer's body of work across a lifetime with his revisions and repudiations, as well as his holding fast to, to some earlier iterations. Warren's permutations throughout his work are particularly relevant to our historical moment in which the pursuit of justice is frequently undermined by a lack of accountability, both personal and societal." Unquote. About her own artistic awakening, Treffway wrote, quote, my Mississippi, my native land with its brutal history of oppression and its terrible beauty hurt me into poetry, rooting me at the crossroads of the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement, staking my claim there." Unquote. Notice the words, claim, rooting, tradition. For tradition redefined, clarified, expanded, not destroyed. There is, after all, enough destruction in the world without our added efforts. Here, Trethway is echoing one of the central arguments that T.S. Eliot makes about the literary tradition, namely, that what is new reorders the past, even as it falls short of remaking it. Unmoored from a commitment to foundational knowledge, the reading culture and thus civics education is in an alarming condition at our high schools and universities. We live in a time of cultural amnesia. We must take concrete steps to address this issue. It is an epidemic with harmful societal implications. Think, for example, about the consequences of a world that has forgotten the horror of the Holocaust. As the United States approaches the 250th year of its founding, NEH encourages projects to promote a deeper understanding of American history and culture that advance civics education and knowledge of our core principles of government. Our agency also views the semi-quincentennial as an opportunity to share the histories of the people on this land before nationhood began, such as the Arapaho or Colorado. In creating this grant category, NEH follows the legislation that brought our agency into being in 1965. It reads, quote, democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens. The arts and the humanities reflect the high place accorded by the American people to the nation's rich cultural heritage and to the fostering of mutual respect for the diverse beliefs and values of all persons and groups. Unquote. We take these words to heart at our agency. Democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens, not merely in our government leaders, but in all of us. The importance of civic responsibility cannot be overstated. It is our duty to support the moral and intellectual growth of our youth. I am also driven by the words of Thomas Jefferson who like all of us was a flawed vessel for delivering wisdom. And yet think about our debt to the Declaration of Independence. I want to linger on another declaration that he made in a letter some 200 years ago. Quote, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. Unquote. Jefferson understood that the prosperity of any nation is inseparable from having an informed populace. State universities are called by definition to help ensure that we have a more informed citizenry. This goal is extraordinarily difficult to achieve when there is no unifying culture. Lincoln had it right. A house divided against itself cannot stand. We as a nation are starting to see the unintended consequences 
of curriculum decisions in recent decades. According to the American Council of Trustees and alumni reports, only 18% of US colleges and universities require even one foundational course in American history or government to graduate. What are some of the consequences of such decisions? For example, 59% of college graduates stated on a multiple choice test that Jefferson, not Madison, was the father of the Constitution. Fewer than half knew Washington was the American general at Yorktown. 40% of college graduates didn't know that the House of Representatives has the power to declare war. Consider what it would mean to live in a future society where crucial moments of history are not comprehended because the foundational knowledge required, the understanding of, and deep engagement in political science, military science, psychology, history, government is out of vogue and little taught or valued in a technocratic world. Historical literacy in our youth has grave societal implications. For, one does, for if one does not understand the founding ideals of our nation, it is difficult to grow into a fully engaged citizen. We cannot ask our young adults to defend representative democracy unless we ensure they have a foundational understanding of its roots. Historical literacy will ultimately result in failures of domestic and foreign policy and in an economically weaker nation that is no longer a leader in innovation much less a leader in humanistic areas, such as moral reasoning and ethics. We must do everything we can as civic leaders, as public officials, as educators, as parents, to ensure that we do not live in a divided America where deep civics education and broad civic engagement are no longer a given. NEH and other federal agencies cannot change this cultural drift ourselves, but we can make catalytic investments in those organizations that are trying to turn this trend around. The abolitionist Frederick Douglass wrote, quote, a great battle lost or won is easily described, understood, and appreciated, but the moral growth of a great nation requires reflection as well as observation to appreciate it, unquote. A healthy voice, a healthy nation allows voices of dissent, such as Douglass's. One need only look at Soviet Russia in the 20th century to re be reminded that the arts and culture flourish best when they remain creatively independent from government control. According to the US, US Bureau of Economic Analysis, the arts and culture sector is a $730 billion industry, which represents 4.2% of our nation's GDP, a larger share of the economy than transportation and agriculture. Culture is big business. Culture is good business. And thus every effort to enhance, shape, redirect, influence, restrict, control, monetize, or cancel it is a public policy action, whether we call it that or not. There is no other economic sector totaling some three-fourths of a trillion dollars that receives so little policy attention. So when I speak of the Western canon, I am not quibbling over sonnets. I am talking about a robust transnational industry. I'm also talking about civic responsibility. Now I'll move to section two of this paper, The Tower of Literature. According to a 2007 NEA study to read or not to read, US employers rank reading and writing as top deficiencies in new hires for both high school and college graduates. The study found that active readers are engaged citizens. Literary readers are more than twice as likely as non-readers to volunteer or do charity work. 
one's reading level matters too. 84% of proficient readers voted in the 2000 presidential election compared with only 53% of the below, below basic readers. Essentially, we are talking about two Americas, a bifurcated nation where the evidence-based discernment that comes from active engagement with literary texts is no longer a common denominator in our educational system. The trend in some cities is horrifying. The Los Angeles Unified School District has lowered the GPA necessary for a high school diploma to a D, a 1.0 on a four point scale, as if lowering standards erases deficiency. Simply stated, a nation that does not read does not survive. A nation that does not read well does not discern. And a nation that does not discern does not prosper. To maintain and expand the reading public, it's important to preserve those literary works that have united generations while making room for new voices from overlooked and marginalized communities. Again, is a both and, not either or proposition. But rather than seek addition and balance, the culture of a liberalism is driven by erasure. And I do wish that the media would not conflate illiberalism with the humanities. The true culture of the humanities is the culture of resilience, is the culture of knowledge, of tolerance, of inclusion and diversity, including viewpoint diversity. For centuries, there has been a clear understanding that our nation's representative democracy and its enduring freedoms spring from Judeo-Christian roots. In times past, scholars have stated this fact, but often have failed to acknowledge that the roots of this tree of knowledge were nurtured in fertile soils across the globe. Our number system, our alphabet, and much of our food ways were borrowed, transformed, incorporated. The list goes on and on and reveals an essential fact. Western culture, is world culture and thus efforts to save it or extinguish it are ultimately actions for or against ancient knowledge writ large. Today, many academics portray Western civilization and its artistic traditions, social societal mores and the governmental systems as a corrupt interlocking operation to be uprooted. This tradition of thought based on classical philosophy and enlightenment rationality is being reclassified as inherently harmful. Until 10 or 15 years ago, even cultural Marxists did not hold this position. Michelangelo, Picasso, Emily Dickinson, and Ralph Ellison, Bach and Mozart were appreciated by scholars and lay people alike for the verb and vitality of their work. Now on too many campuses, in order to praise these creative geniuses, it is first necessary to separate them from the very tradition that influenced them to free them from the canon. This cleaving by design weakens the canon, but more importantly, it lessens our understanding and appreciation of the individual artist in question. As a humanist, I always want more points of reference, more understanding, more depth, more insight, more context, more ways to link the individual to the whole. The word poetry comes to us from the Greek language and it means the made thing. How I ask can a scholar ever hope to comprehend the made thing when she does not fully engage the milieu of the maker? The expansive literary tradition that gave us Homer and Virgil and Shakespeare also gave us the Bible tinge oratory of Frederick Douglass and the searing lyric poems of Sylvia Plath and the magical realism of Gabriel Garcia Marquez and the imagined universes of Octavia Butler. Since every generation of great writers 
builds upon the work of another, like stories added to an ever rising tower of literature, then one should pause before tearing out the very foundation. Preservationists like me, conservators like me, try our best to shore up the tower where it is rotten. And in some dark corner, it is always rotten. We are often among its toughest critics, but from the position of love, we want our literature to be better, stronger, because we treasure it. We, the conservators, know the wisdom of hindsight. We have purged authors following the example of Twain against Finmore Cooper, but we also know what rooms what floors hold a fierce elegance against the ravages of time? Stephen Crane's room shall last. Orwell's room shall last. Gwendolyn Brooks shall. Scott Monday's ever shall last. Is this mere rhetoric? If so, that too is part of the Western tradition. Am I building nothing more than a Tower of Babel? If so, which one? The tower from the Bible or from Borges? Again, I am speaking of an expansive tradition that encompasses entire worlds. I applaud the younger generation of humanists and their mentors for many reasons, including their ability to unlock meaningful knowledge from the deft application of machine learning and digital tools. They are bringing those in the shadows into the light. I understand those who say it would, be better, it would be better to have new houses rather than try to save this old rambling tower. James Baldwin is in this structure for his Western influences are explicit, but I cannot deny that if he had agency in this metaphorical tower, he might just burn it down. And if we rebuild it, would not Samson bring it down again? Which may be for the best, as surely the residents cannot endure many more hours of King Lear raging in the lobby, Charlotte Bronte's mad woman in the attic, Captain Ahab patrolling the stairwells in search of what does not live in the air. This is the Tower of Literature, as I know it. I was trained by the last of the new critics at the university where the idea was born. And I was trained by the very theorists who ensured that those so-called dinosaurs were the last of their type. But here's the thing, we all believed in the tower. We were fixing it up each in our own way. I've spent every day since my teens, all these decades, in the Tower of Literature, seeking my nation, and my people, and myself, as much as any objective knowledge. And I will spend what days remain in and out of these rooms. I see plain that my own literary efforts will not congeal into a room of my own. I'm at peace with that. I rest in the knowledge that my NEH and NEA colleagues and I have funded dozens and dozens of scholars and authors whose bright, brilliant works are reminders of the full complexity and richness of the world, real and imagined. The problem with the liberalism is that it lacks discernment. It solves bad plumbing with a wrecking ball and walks away. The resulting stench finally drives everyone out of the towering house away from the enduring foundational values of the humanities into a world full of liberties, but with precious few responsibilities to the common good. We might turn to see you, Professor Martin Bickman's article, Returning to Community and Praxis, as one guidepost on the road to greater unity. Whatever our path, we must be open to dialogue with everyone who truly wants this, to make this tower into a home, into a place where we are all welcome, and I mean all.
to expand the circle, we must draw students into a deeper relationship with the written word and oral culture, rather than overwhelming them with jargon-laden theory as a recruitment tool. I worry that literary critics have spent so much energy dissecting the body that we have failed to tell people how much we love it. As everyday people, we do not read to unpack metaphors, but because we love to read, because it deepens our understanding of the world. It creates empathy in us and enables us to go about our lives as more informed citizens. I wish that we would spend more time talking about how we came to love these works as opposed to chasing buried messages between sentences. The Academy has made considerable progress in expanding the Western canon, but we have abandoned a commitment to sequential learning in American literature, world history, and the like. We offer students a lit class on the lost generation of Hemingway and company, but do not deign to add a 20th century European history course even on the 100th anniversary of the war to end all wars. We teach the cultural contributions of entire nations to fragments. Numerous cultural organizations have taken upon themselves to fill the void left in the wake of an atomized curriculum built upon fascinating courses that nevertheless do not solidify into a system of sequential learning. Yes, I'm advocating for introductory survey courses in literature and especially in history, but I'm not hearkening back to how civics was taught a generation or two ago. A course on the Revolutionary War, for example, can augment traditional textbooks with, with the paintings of Jacob Lawrence, documentaries, podcasts, and educational games such as iCivics, Race to Ratify, an NEH-funded resource on the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. Whatever path we choose, there is no excuse for the liberal arts to be out of favor, out of touch, or out of the curriculum. For millennia, it has tackled the big questions such as, what are the habits of mind that we want to instill in young people? We are past the tipping point in terms of the dominance of the humanities and the undergraduate curriculum, our culture, and our communities. But the humanities diffused are still the humanities everywhere. Yes, yes, the academic left has disparaged the Western tradition in recent years. But the political right has its own actions to account for too. Conservative intellectuals made an unconscious but damaging, damaging decision in the late 20th century to narrow their interest in the humanities largely to jurisprudence, political science, economics, and occasionally history and philosophy within a restricted range. Religion, yes, but religious studies, less so. Even Russell Kirk could not arrest this reorientation of appetite. Western art and literature, music and dance, languages ancient and modern were largely abandoned and thus the creative class abandoned as well. If an American university driven by its liberal arts mission is rare a generation from now, I fear that two overlapping and interconnected tragedies will have caused it. One, conservative intellectuals will have failed to save the teaching of Western civilization because they withdrew from or allowed themselves to be run off from the departments of art, classical studies, English philosophy at all. And the institutional leaders and funders did not intervene to preserve what the conservatives no longer valued. And two, progressive academics will have lacked the necessary authority and respect beyond the campus to advocate successfully for the liberal arts because what began as rhetoric devolved into policy and the general public has a substantial distaste for ideologies targeting shared heritage for removal. We spend a considerable amount of time 
in the academy on what divides us. Let us speak about what we are all for, not merely what we are individually against. We cannot get to a place of shared values as we, if we pursue dialogue through the hermeneutics of suspicion. What is needed is a great compromise where ideologically diverse humanities faculty come together to advocate for an expansive canon based in academic rigor, but open to diverse voices of all backgrounds. NEH and the Teagle Foundation have funded a new pilot program called Cornerstone, Living for Learning to reinvigorate the general education curriculum in a manner complementary to this objective. Now, section three, my final section. I have a bit of water here. I want to close with a story about a wartime letter. Our nation's cultural infrastructure is as vast as the Library of Congress, and it is as small as an unopened letter. When I contemplate awarding nearly a thousand grants per year, more than $200 million this year, it's easy to get lost. It's easy to remember the big grants, the multi-night PBS documentaries watched by millions, the Pulitzer Prize winners. So I try often, though small. And the NEH funded Kurt Vonnegut Museum and Library in Indianapolis, there is an unopened letter. Here's the story of that letter, or a bit of it. Having dropped out of college to fight in World War II, the 22-year-old Kurt Vonnegut was captured at the Battle of the Bulge. As a prisoner of war, he was taken to the city of Dresden. Around this time, his father wrote him a letter from Indiana. It was returned to the family with the word missing informally written across the address in ink. The word missing is in all caps. Can you imagine the anguish of that family? The Allies firebombed Dresden in 1945. To give you a sense of the scale of the air raid, nearly 1,300 bombers participated. The estimate of those killed has varied widely, most likely between 10 and 50,000. Vonnegut survived in a meat locker of a subterranean slaughterhouse. That's where many POWs lived when they were on the work crews. Vonnegut described what happened after the bombing, quote, after that, we were put to work carrying corpses from the air raid shelters, women, children, old men, dead from concussion, fire, or suffocation. Civilians cursed us and threw rocks as we carried bodies to huge funeral pyres in the city, unquote. And it bears noting here that I can read letters from citizens liberated by the Allied forces from death camps. Numerous NEH projects provide a comprehensive perspective. After the war, Vonnegut fall, found his natural gift, writing. His autobiographical anti-war classic, Slaughterhouse Five, came out in 1969 during the height of the Vietnam War. When the novel reaches the bombing of Dresden, Vonnegut writes that the narrator gets unstuck in time. The order of events is flipped. The bombs aren't dropped. They rise up from the ground. He describes the aerial attack in a reverse sequence. I'll quote from at length, quote, the formation flew backwards over a German city that was in flames. The bombers opened their bomb bay doors, exerted a miraculous magnetism which shrunk the fires, gathered them into cylindrical steel tubes, and lifted the containers into the bellies of the planes. The containers were stored neatly in racks. The Germans below had miraculous devices of their own, which were long steel tubes. They used them to suck more fragments from the crewmen and planes. When the bombers got back to their base, 
the steel cylinders were taken from the racks and shipped back to the United States of America, where factories were operating night and day, dismantling the cylinders, separating the dangerous contents into minerals. The minerals were then shipped to specialists in remote areas. It was their business to put them into the ground, to hide them cleverly, so they would never hurt anyone ever again." Unquote. This is what Emily Dickinson called telling all the truth, but telling it slant. There are some stories too difficult to go at directly. And Vonnegut the soldier and Vonnegut the writer knew this. Considering the suppressed anguish in this passage written decades after his military service, it is not surprising that Kurt Vonnegut could not open his father's letter when he returned from war. He couldn't open it the first week or the next week or the next one or the one after. He couldn't open the letter after his father died. He could not after his own children were born. He could not after his novel was published. Kurt Vonnegut died at age 84. He never opened the letter from his father. His family never opened it either. So the unopened letter sits behind a glass case in Indiana and now high school students write about what they think might be in the letter. As historian Jim Grossman likes to say, everything has a history. Someone printed that envelope and someone designed that stamp for the US government and someone flew that stamped letter to Europe and someone else carried it across the killing fields. Someone else brought it to a stopping point, wrote the news missing and sent it back in the other direction a reversal akin to Vonnegut's literary reversal. Friends, teaching history and civics and ethics is essential. It's not hard, nor is it easy. It is mostly about researching the facts, finding a through line, shaping a narrative, and staying with it, even when it seems like no one on the other side of the room is listening. I can attest that someone is always listening. What about the unopened letters in your community, in your time and place, maybe indeed in your own life? Some letters, as we have seen, draw their power from remaining unopened. But by and large, the humanities are about writing and opening and reading and preserving and presenting and interpreting such letters. For more than two centuries, we have as a people and a government done such as with the Thomas Jefferson letter that I quoted earlier. But we have not as a people or a nation done enough to embody its message. In the midst of this pandemic, we must seek a renewed commitment to optimism, which is to say a new commitment to one another. The humanities are what bind us together on our common journey especially when the better angels of our nature seem so far away. We all know about the decline in liberal arts majors, and hence the decline in a certain way of understanding both the world and the history of the world. And yet I'm an optimist. I worry about what has been lost, de-emphasized or ignored on our campuses and in our culture, such as civility itself, and I worry about our capacity to bring it back. And yet I'm an optimist. With eyes wide open, with a sense of realism, with historical understanding, I still believe that we must do everything we can to commit ourselves to optimism, not merely for ourselves, but for those who come next, so they too can live meaningful, impactful, fulfilling lives. Think again for a moment upon the letters the generations of Americans cast into the abyss of war. Every writer of books, every reader of letters, every preserver of culture is an optimist. Every one of these acts is a statement that there is a future that you want to inform and enlighten 
and educate in some way, large or small. It is all of that and so much more. There's an act of love, of longing, of fear, of anger, of sorrow, even rage sometimes. But above all, there's an act of faith and of hope. So friends, as I have said, I am an optimist, have always been an optimist, will always be one. Every grant maker is at heart an optimist. And because you are listening on this day for your own reasons, I cannot help but think in spite of all the barriers, you are an optimist too. Thank you. Thank you for such an eloquent talk. Thank you. Let me remind the audience that uh, the way to ask a question is to scroll down to the bottom of uh, the Zoom window and the Q&A, you'll see a Q&A section. You can enter your question there. If you're a student, please note that you're a student and we'll give priority to your questions. Now let me jump in to some, some audience questions. Sure. Tenured faculty members at many camp campuses across the United States are among the fiercest critics of teaching works from the Western here. Do you have suggestions on how to address this? Well, I believe one of the most important things is to not talk about generalities, but, but to talk about individual books. So I cited Frederick Douglass for a very, very particular reason. Um, he had a narrow amount of uh, literary works that could influence him, the Bible being part of it. Um, he took, um, in that case, some Old Testament metaphors and, and turned it around uh, as, as other enslaved people did uh, and talked about getting out of the Babylonian captivity. That, that, that narrative uh, continued, of course, in the spirituals in the 20th century, my home state of Mississippi, both the spirituals and the blues songs. So um, I think uh, that we're throwing out too many extraordinary works. And I'll just say, for example, I spent a lot of my uh, free time and, and career of looking at Faulkner's work. Toni Morrison was emphatic about what she learned from Faulkner. Um, she credited him for creating fully realized African-Americans, in this case, a more common African-American woman uh, at a time when, when you could not find uh, her people depicted in books, uh, certainly in any affirming way. Uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, look to Faulkner as well, really, really connected uh, in a deep and meaningful way. And of course, all three of them had the Nobel Prize. So quite often when I hear a pushback against the Western canon, I hear it from literary scholars, but literary writers, just as radical, by the way, Toni Morrison was, you know, no one's conformist. Uh, and, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you know, had a fondness of strong men such as Fidel Castro. These, you know, these are, uh, uh, these are not conservative thinkers. What they said is, this is available to me and I can take from this tradition. I think uh, the great painters will say that. Uh, I mentioned Jacob Lawrence. Look at Jacob Lawrence's uh, paintings of the American Revolution. He recenters the story of the Boston Massacre. Uh, he makes it clear that it is uh, uh, what was at the time considered African, not African-American, African who was killed, who's the sacrificial American. Um, so I, I think there's a lot to be said for the power of marginalized people in the canon. Um, and, and I just, you know, I, I have dear friends who disagree with me on this, but, but I know enough creative writers who have made the canon their own and, and remade it uh, their own. Thanks. A listener asks, I'd like to ask Mr. Petey to distinguish among terms like political ideological and apolitical. Are there subjects that are inherently apolitical and others that are inherently political? And what role do electoral politics play in perceptions of the political and apolitical? I'm thinking specifically of the executive order of the Trump administration that charges that critical race theory is political propaganda rather than a valid field of intellectual inquiry. Uh, well, some of those issues about defining what's uh, political and others, you, you may be in the two of us uh, better to uh, better able to speak to it. I can say this, I, I've been uh, 
been a, I was appointed by President Bush originally. The Obama administration asked me to stay. Um, I'm in the Trump administration. I'm working with the Biden transition team. So four presidents. Uh, and uh, what I found that the way I'm able to, to conduct myself is to make the best decisions uh, that I can uh, consistent with the mission and the charge of my agency. And that's what my colleagues do. So uh, each administration that I've been in has talked about priorities. Um, and, and by the way, there's a lot more through lines than people would think. Uh, I, I've alluded to being a Southerner. Uh, all three administrations I was part of talked about outreach to rural states being important. Um, it wasn't just one party or, or the other. So I, I think there's a lot more commonality. What I said, to my staff, uh, we've certainly have given grants and will announce some in a few weeks uh, since that executive order about critical race theory came through. As I said to my staff, this is a legal document. It's interpreted by our lawyers, but let's be careful in reading it and make sure we don't over extrapolate. So for example, I'm gonna give hypothetical, uh, well, I won't name the grantees, but each one of these is actually something we funded. Uh, we funded uh, Lift Every Voice. I'll, I'll plug this incredible anthology from Library of America by uh, my friend Kevin Young uh, that is centuries of African-American protest, poetry, and song. So the word protest is in the title. Uh, that would be eligible. Uh, I would have funded that this year. I funded it a couple of years ago, but I would have funded it this year. Uh, I funded oral histories uh, for Native American tribes with Little Bighorn College. That, that would be eligible. Uh, we've had funding around the Stonewall uprising that would be eligible. Um, so it's important not to extrapolate too far. Um, but I, um, you know, I'm, I work in the federal government. Uh, we are legally required to comply with the executive orders. We do. Uh, if those executive orders um, are rescinded, uh, then we will comply with that as well. But, but if I could get it, if I might, I want to get at the heart of the question. Um, is this endowment still the people's endowment? Is it, is, it, is, is it exciting, provocative, engaging, new work happening? Absolutely. I have 170 colleagues that have done that through a pandemic, and they're incredible. And, uh, and their integrity as individuals and as scholars uh, is so crystal clear. And so, um, so what I would say to somebody is, let's move beyond generalizations to, to, the, to the practical thing is, if you have a great project, we want to see it. Many thanks for your talk. The next question begins. My question is about civic engagement. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the reason why there's less of it than we'd like to see is because it's prudentially irrational. This question perhaps has taken one of my courses. The, the chance that any individual will make a political difference is approximately zero. And yet it takes a lot of time and effort to become adequately informed about the issues of the day. Your suggestion that we require college students to take history and civic courses will go some, some distance here, but probably not far enough, since one can be an expert about the history and workings of our government and still be totally ignorant about what sorts of policies the government ought to pursue. That sort of knowledge is very difficult to acquire. Even the experts disagree. What incentives to bu do busy individuals have to become informed? Um, I believe everything in the individual. I, uh, uh, I, I would say emphatically, um, this democracy, all, all the forms of government uh, that uh, mean so much to us. And by the way, uh, uh, the reason a lot of failed governments came down too uh, was to strengthen individuals. So. Uh, I am always, uh, you know, just as I said, I don't want generalities. I, I, I want something uh, more precise. Uh, the humanities endowment, if our funding is nothing else, it is the funding of extraordinary individuals. And uh, so, and that's not the same, by the way, as saying the old great man theory of history. I'm not talking about that. Uh, but um, I emphatically believe in individuals. One of the exciting parts about the expansion of, of the canon uh, is that it is bringing in individuals. Uh, and uh, my, my daughter had me read 
uh, a book um, that was uh, really about the Me Too movement in South Korea, and it's a brand new book. It's been translated in 18 languages, and you know these these awakenings are happening because an individual artist or scholar uh, paid attention to an overlooked story. Um, the second half of the question, Daniel, that that I needed to say that part. Uh, do you want to reframe uh, the second half of that? Uh, uh, yes, let me try to do that. Um, I'll take notes uh, next time. <laughs> it's a long question. Yeah. Um, it, the, the suggestion is that taking that that taking history and civics courses, if if we can encourage more students to take history and civics courses, then that'll go some distance towards um, palliating the the problem of um, rational ignorance. Uh, here, uh, but probably not far enough, the questioner suggests, since one can be expert about one field and workings of some aspect of the government and yet ignorant about, about others, it's very difficult to acquire the kind of knowledge that's necessary to uh, implement public policy and even the experts disagree. So how do we, what kinds of incentives can we give to busy people who have other things to do with yeah. their lives um, to become yeah. better informed? Well. I think as, as scholars are able to think about my field of, of literature, as much as we can try to get out of the way, you know, um, it's a little tougher because you can read, you can get tenure for writing a book of history and I can still go read it even though it's not my field. I don't think many of us can do that with literary scholarship if you're outside the field of literature. So some of us are just more specialized. Uh, so, you know, if I said to people, please read more scholarship, I, I have to define really uh, department I'm talking about in humanities. Uh, about being busy, we're all making choices all the time. Uh, I read for a living and write for a living, and I come down from that experience by reading books. You know, I make that conscious decision. And some decades of my life, uh, when I had a young daughter, I made it differently than now. But uh, uh, it's, it's, it's about making choices. And um, I don't think we should make people feel guilty about it. I don't think it's keeping a list of you read 20 books or you're smarter than one you read five. Um, it has been said often that, you know, I, I said something about the humanities and liberal arts generating empathy in us and there are studies to that, but I have heard the quip that anybody that thinks it brings empathy has never been in an academic department meeting. Um, what I would say is that it enhances what's in you. The old phrase that um, when you become greatly wealthy, it enhances what you already were. I think that's what the liberal arts and humanities bring out of us. If you're an inquisitive person who wants to make a difference in the world, in your community, uh, then the more knowledge you pour into your mind, the more so you're gonna become that person. Um, and do you pass through cynicism, depression, all that, all those emotions still happen, of course they do. But um, there's a reason across cultures, uh, radically different cultures. And uh, we bury and bring children, we bring children in the world and we bury people that basically song, poetry, sacred verse. There's a reason um, because when we're broken, it gives us something else to get us through. And I could not for one imagine going through something like the pandemic and having nothing to fall back into but the void. Thanks. On another note, as head of the NEH, what do you see as the federal government's role and more specifically the NEH's role in fostering the value of liberal arts in the Western literary canon in the academy? So uh, I think doing events such as this, you know, I did speak more as an individual than I normally do. You know, uh, when I said, you know, I, when I'm saying I'd like to see the, maybe the left might think about this, the right might think about that. I don't tend to, to do that in many of my speeches. Um, I think there's a role to help Congress think through gaps, to help the White House think through gaps uh, in the structure of our funding and other agencies. But here's what is important. Here's what I do. Uh, a lot of people compare our model to the European model. 
I don't think they realize honestly, uh, and they condemn ours for, for less money. I don't think uh, they realize how much in these systems is a guild. The amount of, you know, I, I started, um, when I was in the Bush administration, we joined UNESCO. In this administration, we, we left UNESCO. But as we started working with a lot of our European partners, wonderful partners, but uh, there was not a peer review system. It was a lot more who you knew about who, who got grants. And I think people forget that. Plus, when you add up the NEA, NEH, INLS, Smithsonian, Kennedy Center, Library of Congress, Holocaust Museum, National Gallery, uh, our funding of culture is in the billions. So what I do like about American, the American system, and particularly if I were uh, the person writing the note is, I would be worried if they just heard my speech and I spoke about literature all the time with a few painters mentioned. And that person's focus is uh, uh, 19th century French music. And I didn't mention it at all. And they think, oh my gosh, the you know, chairman doesn't like it. I'm not gonna get funded. The nice thing about our system is the grant category is elastic enough. And if we have a peer review panel and it will be a peer panel that understands music in that century, and they recommend it to the staff, and the staff looks at the application, uh, makes its recommendation. We have a national council, which, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, President Benson has served on, uh, Honorable Patty Limerick, one of the professors who's advisor to the Benson Center, served on it uh, 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 quite recently, actually, and, and they recommend it. So uh, I would say that you don't want the federal government to have too narrow a focus. So we talk about special incentives. I mentioned, I did mention the name of it is the More Perfect Union Project, but it's for the semi-quincentennial. Uh, we have special government-wide uh, categories that are only for HBCUs, tribal colleges, high Hispanic serving institutions. Other federal agencies have, have the same uh, category of funding. So we do have some of those categories but I think my job is to leave it elastic enough so that I don't miss something. Think if, uh, the, you know, I'm the youngest chairman we've you know, had in a couple of decades. I'm the only chairman born after 1947. So by the time I was out of grad school, you know, the internet didn't exist. So would I be the one who would think of digital humanities? I don't know that I would. Uh, it was the staff and the field that came forward. So um, it's great when you hear somebody who has the, uh, a really well-defined plan until you don't fit in that plan. So what I like about it is if you're in grad school or a scholar, an independent scholar in particular, uh, you're gonna find that there are 40 something categories, something that fits your scholarship. The next question um, is, is based on, for thanks you for your talk, um, but then it's based on uh, our, the Benson Center's theme of the year, which is community and disunity. Uh, the, the questioner says, I thought you made very lucid points about how the humanities have a tremendous unifying potential across topics, countries, and languages. I enjoyed the tower analogy very much. Oh, good. Do you have something to say about how humanity sometimes brings us apart? And is there a balance to be struck between how should we how should we go about it, privileging community over disunity when addressing writers, thinkers, and other cultural products? Yes, well, part of it, and not that it's unique to me, is proximity. I, I, I think one part about the pandemic is uh, our days never end. You know, we've all been in front of this monitor forever. Uh, we say things on social media that we would never say to somebody in the faculty lounge. Uh, and so it, uh, um, this, this mode of communication, uh, whether pandemic or not, uh, the, the, um, the idea that you come to know people um, through a medium with sometimes they're the harshest is a problem. So I hate to be old fashioned, but I love book reading groups and, and I love uh, going to the theater where they have you know talks afterwards. Um, or, or beforehand, uh, I had the privilege of seeing Hamilton with, I don't know, a thousand high school students that got together free and just the actors talking and then the students going up and acting out their own uh, creations. And so 
I think community uh, is, you know, the, the reason that community and communal are tied and communion uh, uh, echo each other is, is for a reason. And so, so part of it would be, what can we do to put ourselves in proximity? Um, I spent before the pandemic uh, about uh, 125 days to 150 days a year going around the country. Um, and there's a reason. Uh, I've never spent as long at a, you know, an Ivy League institution as I have a Native American reservation for a reason. Um, you know, I was the first chairman to go to our, our funding, you know, we've been funding Guam and the Northern Marianas uh, for a long, long time, but no chairman had, had gone. And so it's, it's shocking to say how many times it's about showing up um, and, um, and being in each other's presence requires a deeper level of civility, in my experience. Forgive me for this bit of self-promotion, but we are having at the Benson Center, we're having a panel on Hamilton, the musical, in which we talked to a number of people, historians and people involved in the, the creation of the, of the musical itself a little later um, next term, actually. Oh, that's, that's, look, look that's for great. That. That's great. <laughs> well, we'll be your press agent on social media for that. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have about time for, for about, about one more question. Um, I'll, 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 I'll give this to you and um, with the understanding that you've you, you've mentioned some before and, and um, uh, already, but I'll, I'll I'll let you answer it as as you like. Sure. Um, the the listener asks, Mr. Chairman, thank you for what you do to help our nation. Do you have favorite projects or grants that you've that you've made? Oh, my last question. Now you're going to get me in trouble. Plus, I'll have to spool all night on Twitter. You know, naming the groups I've left out. Um, uh, you know, quite often it's, it's what I did last. Um, now I know we're about to announce some grants in two weeks, so I have to be super careful not to mention some, you know, that were just funded. Um, but, uh, gosh, you know, a couple of, for example, uh, I, I went home to Mississippi and the, at the, uh, uh, Delta Blues Museum. They had an after-school program, you know, after-school humanities program, if you will, arts and humanities. And um, it was um, talking about the history of the blues, and also it had, you know, teaching uh, uh, guitar and bass uh, uh, to the students in the community. And um, you would not have known it was a teenager. You would have thought it was muddy waters. And to be in that room and look upon it, and to look at signs about Jim Crow America. Um, that was profoundly impactful, um, gave me hope and, and not naive hope, knowing it's a road. Um, I, I, I had the privilege of uh, being on the bridge the last time uh, Congressman John Lewis crossed it. I was asked to give a speech and I did it in the courthouse uh, where the march was cleared. Um, uh, with John Lewis, the first person in the chair and, that always be special to me, uh, but that was built on all our funding, uh, the uh, Freedom Riders films and uh, our summer teachers institutes. Uh, and that, that was, uh, it was deeply, uh, deeply powerful. I, I, I won't go on because I know there's a time limit, but uh, what I would say is I tend to love those projects that empower people or communities in a new way. Uh, I thought, and, and, and by the way, I said something about being elastic and I'm gonna come back to that. When we funded uh, oral histories at Little Bighorn uh, uh, College of Montana. We were open, we said we wanna fund the oral histories. We assumed they might wanna to talk to the tribal elders, particularly before, before they passed. And it was also about preserving the language, uh, letting people uh, speak in, the, in their mother tongue if they desired to do so. And instead, what they really came back through on that project was the generation that was part of desegregation of schools. And, and they were Native Americans going into what were the predominantly or dominantly white schools and, and they weren't treated so well. And it was talking about the 50s and 60s and they picked a different idea. And of course, our panels agree with them. I agree with them, I funded it. Uh, what I love is when an applicant says, no, you know, I'm on to something. I believe in my story being told my way. 
and I want to hear about the grant and the grant process, and I'm taking your notes, but um, this is the story I have in me. And so that's what I love. Um, that's what I loved when I, uh, I hate to not be there in person and talk to your students when I was at the center, you know, of the American West and in person, I, you know, I guess what, 18 months ago or something. That was a great part, just hearing the undergrads idea. Uh, and knowing, by the way, I don't know about you, but I was nowhere near that smart or focused or together. Um, I, I'm always kind of in shock about that. Uh, so I'm, I'm happiest in what we did last. And, um, and that when the grantee stuck to what they knew was right and we had the wisdom to see it. Great, let me apologize to those who had questions that I couldn't get to. Unfortunately, one of the, the troubles with these Zoom talks um, is that we as an audience can't um, really adequately express our appreciation for, for your talk. But please, to the audience, uh, uh, join me wherever you are and in, in, in thanking Mr. Petey for uh, his talk and for the answers to our questions. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, thank you. It's been my honor. So, so thanks so much and uh, uh, take care everyone, please. Great. Okay. okay.